Haley Bunzold. I'm 19. I'll be 20 pretty soon. And I'm going to be a junior in college at Chapman University. I'm a double major in peace studies and sociology with a minor in political science. Um, and the thing that I'm working on right now that I think might define some of what career path I'll go on is a research project with Dr. Pete Simi, who is a leading American professional in studying white supremacy. And I'm currently a research assistant on his project studying threats to public officials. I found feminism when I was 12. Um, I found feminism on the day that Donald Trump was elected president of the United States. Um, I was riding in the car with my dad the night before election results were actually announced and determined. We were listening to NPR and I asked him, how far ahead is Hillary Clinton? And he was like, oh, she's going to lose. And I thought he was joking with me. Um, and so I laughed and he said, no, there's, there's no way she's catching up in the electoral college. Uh, the next president is going to be Donald Trump. And that was such a weird sensation, almost like a little bit of shock, totally thinking that this was some weird joke. Um, and I went to school the next day and my favorite teacher, Mrs. Battle, she was my English history and student body teacher, um, sat us all in a classroom and talked very openly about what his election meant to her and her safety, both as a woman, um, but as a black woman as well. In the wake of Donald Trump's election came the Women's March. Um, and although I didn't participate the first year, seeing all of those images was just like crazy. I think it was the first time I had seen that many women come together to be angry about something. I didn't experience anger as a kid. Sadness was really my primary emotion. Um, and so I think a lot of the anger that I felt when I was a kid manifested itself in tears. But to see this group of women that yes they were angry maybe not experiencing that anger as viscerally as they had before but had the opportunity to come together and feel some sort of catharsis because they knew that the person standing next to them was involved in that same sort of emotion that they were going through too was really powerful i think it was an original experience of group solidarity that i i hadn't had before yeah and then from there I think I probably became known as the feminist girl at school. Um, probably had that word used against me a couple times too. Um, but I think the way that I represented it when I was 12, 13, 14 was just blatantly wrong. And I had a lot to learn. Seeing feminism as so white and for white women and not seeing it as the inclusive movement that it is, I think allowed me to put down other girls who I didn't see as thinking or doing the same things as me in the name of feminism or adopting a sort of color blindness in the name of feminism. And that began to change over time because I just got older, but also the Black Lives Matter movement happened when I was a junior in high school and that rocked me. Seeing the footage of George Floyd, which I later came to watch, um, was horrifying and it led me down a rabbit hole of reading a lot about the American experience as a black American rather than the bubble that I had been living in my whole life. I would say coming here really solidified the idea that feminism is intersectional and it's not essentialist, that it's, I really enjoyed Bell Hook's definition of it, that it's a movement against sexist oppression and that of course it makes sense that my dad took me to my first women's march because he's against sexist oppression too. Like so many people are shocked when they're like, your dad took you to a women's march? I'm like, well, yeah, he got it before I did, you know? Um, so really solidifying that idea of intersectionality and what it means to be aware of patriarchy. One of the major things that upholds patriarchy 
is this idea that vulnerability is weakness. It kills men daily, but it also rots away in women. And some of the people that we have seen be the most vulnerable and therefore the most courageous in standing in the face of patriarchy and therefore creating the most change have been members of the LGBTQ community who have shown who they are and have been willing to step into a society that doesn't support them. We don't have language to dismantle patriarchy. We only have the language to criticize it. And that's purposeful in order to combat what is trying to take you down you have to live openly and that doesn't mean letting people walk all over you but it means being honest with your experiences so that you can deeply connect with people and not hiding behind a shell of what the patriarchy will call courage because courage to the patriarchy is isolation and in order to be a collective unit that works to disassemble the patriarchy, we have to do it together. And the only way that we can come together is through being vulnerable with each other. So a lot of what we have to learn is learning how to be a new sort of courageous, and that courageousness will be defined by coming together in vulnerable spaces to talk about who we are, what we know, what we don't know. Um, and I guess in a sort of feminist tactic, consciousness race. I would really like to start a family. I would love to have children. Um, the thing that in my mind really holds me back from that is how unfair it might be to them if we continue on the path of climate change that we are, which we're going to. <laughs> I think it would be selfish to have kids for my own fulfillment, only to put them in a world that is actively dying and to ask them to live in and combat against that every day and I'm not sure how I would deal with that guilt of knowing what I was sending a child into.